हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग मैडम तातियाना गुड मॉर्निंग professor gunter am i all, am i audible sorry i did not understand can you say again uh, am i audible to you okay So can you see the presentation and can you hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, Professor Gunter, uh, good morning. Uh, can you please hold on for a minute? Uh, I would like to know if we can start the session. Uh, do you mean me? Oh, uh, I no. Uh, I'm, I'm just checking with the organizers. Shall we start the presentations now? Okay. Yes, I think so. Okay, so then good afternoon, uh, uh, the respected speakers. Uh, now the session, uh, we are going to have six presentations and each presentation is going to be for 20 minutes. And uh, I, after 15 minutes, I will request you to please stop your presentation and then we'll have some question and answer session. I mean, to start with, uh, the first presentation uh, is going to be delivered by uh, Professor Gunther Kolb from Fraunhofer, uh, Maine, Germany. And the title is of the presentation, the development of a two-stage reactor concept for the methanation of carbon dioxide from renewable sources. Now I request to Professor uh, Kolb, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I hope everybody can see the presentation. I didn't get any feedback yet. Uh, so, from a market perspective, uh, bio-natural gas can be used in, in uh, various energy sectors for heating, for transportation, and for synthesis of chemicals. As we all know, its transportation is easy, and it can be practically unlimited be stored in the existing distribution net network for natural gas. And uh, that, that would be an efficient use of the already existing infrastructure. So it has, biogas has considerable advantages in terms of sustainability compared to other energy sources, maybe be from renewable or fossil origin. Different to hydrogen, the integration of bio-natural gas into current energy systems, therefore does not require any major investments and no major reconstruction of the current infrastructure. Biogas can be directly, can directly reduce greenhouse gas emissions because it can replace methane of fossil origin and to the extent biogas is fed into the natural gas grid, power to gas systems enable the coupling of the electricity and the gas networks. If the heat generated by the exothermic catalytic methanation reaction is uh, utilized, can also be used to, uh, coupled to district heating networks, for example. And this opens up opportunities for integrated uh, energy concepts, which could solve the current problems of the imbalance between rene renewable energy supply and demand and the seasonally strongly uh, fluctuating energy demand. The situation in Germany, is the following uh, funding of many biogas plants expires now. Uh, 
remuneration for the energy generation is lowering the substrate substrate costs are increasing and there are continuous changes of the energy laws and this creates a need for for a new business model to make biogas production economically viable also on the medium to long term the job creation through biogas industry in germany alone is substantial and it's uh, limited to mostly rural sectors which makes it even more important and if there is not a viable solution found uh, all these jobs could be at risk and one possibility would be to transfer from pure electricity production uh, to energy storage in the future scenario what are the technical challenges of the methanation reaction we heard most of them already in the last days. So we have a required rapid response to the dynamic operation. We need an efficient heat management of the exothermic methanation reaction. And of course, there is uh, sulfur removal uh, in, the, in the plants installed, but there might be some at least minor uh, sulfur breakthrough and therefore a certain sulfur resistance and of course in general a high selectivity of the catalyst is required yeah? and conventional plants uh, mostly rely on two-step fixed bed reactor technology we have applied our microstructured heat exchanger reactors to develop a novel process approach to uh, face these challenges and it has been uh, especially uh, developed for carbon dioxide from biogas plants and um, some major uh, issues uh, of this concept are that we apply catalyst coatings and internal cooling in the second reactor stage and the carbon dioxide is not separated from the biogas but converted in the presence of methane so this biogas upgrading, which is the CO2 separation, cre creates substantial greenhouse gas emissions as we calculated from a thorough life cycle analysis of the whole process. So the idea is to run uh, the reaction at a high temperature in the first reactor stage, and then go into a second stage after cooling and water removal, as I will show later on and in the reactor then decrease the temperature and come from high reaction rate and low equilibrium conversion towards uh, higher equilibrium conversion at lower temperature. And of course, uh, this is uh, associated with a low reaction rate then. So this shows the, the principle of the process. So we have a first stage adiabatic reactor, monolithic, then we do some heat removal, cooling down, we remove the water, we go through a heat exchanger which preheats the feed with a product, and we go into the second stage reactor, which in the current case is uh, operated with a counter current oil cooling. Nevertheless, we in, in, in the next stage we tend to move even to air cooling uh, because it's simpler. Yeah, we did uh, a lot of catalyst development for the methanation. We did that in our small microstructure testing reactors, which you see on the top right. Micro channels, only a few, few hundred milligrams of catalysts. And uh, we developed both uh, ruthenium and nickel and mixed of both uh, catalysts uh, which show a high conversion uh, in the temperature range of the second reactor stage and which also show uh, stable behavior so constant conversion uh, over longer period of time we increased 
the, the sulfur resistance by specific uh, additives. So the catalyst can uh, now uh, resist at least uh, one ppm of hydrogen sulfide in the field uh, for a duration of about 100 hours without apparent uh, deactivation, which would be initially uh, observed within a few hours at the with, with the catalyst formulation, we started to work with at the beginning. Yeah, then we also looked at the high temperature resistance. So we are talking about a temperature range of about 600 degrees. Um, see here, obviously the uh, conversion and, and uh, methane selectivity goes down significantly. Uh, which follows the thermodynamic equilibrium also, and, and carbon monoxide is formed, which then can be converted in the second reactor stage quite easily. So we see here a durability test at, at performed at 600 degrees with uh, biogas surrogate, uh, uh, and uh, there is some, some water also present in the feed. We also tested uh, changing uh, the CO2 to methane ratio, the effect on the catalyst performance. And after some, some initial uh, loss of activity, the, the conversion remains apparently constant during several changes of, of the composition, which might happen in practical plants because different uh, suppliers might feed their biogas into the plant. So this shows a PNID of the small test plant we had set up. Uh, going through it very quickly, um, the feed is mixed and preheated, uh, sent through the first reactor stage, then cooled down, water is separated, goes through the heat exchange, as I showed before, and then through the uh, reactor, which has the integrated oil cooling uh, product, is then going through a heat exchange again, water is removed, and the purified uh, bio, converted biogas can then be fed into the gas grid. So the first stage reactor, we used a, a monolith, which was uh, not a FICRA alloy monolith, but it was a 3D printed monolith, which has some advantages concerning heat conductivity over the reactor, length axis, axis and uh, distributes through heat conduction, the heat better in, in the reactor. So we performed some modeling of, of low distributions and pressure resistance. Second reactor stage is um, plate heat exchanger reactor coated with a catalyst uh, with counter current pooling. And also here we performed some uh, simulations of the low distribution and the pressure, pressure resistance of the catalyst. So we uh, also uh, simulated the heat generation and we, we saw a quite even uh, temperature distribution over the width of the, of the reactor. Only about five Kelvin temperature difference occurred and uh, through the plate to the cooling side, uh, the temperature gradient is, as it is usual for this kind of reactors, of course, is quite low in the range of only one Kelvin, according to the simulations. This is a small test plant we set up. All the components I had described before uh, have been installed in there, and we perform measurements with it. And as you can see here, Depending on the reaction temperature, as to be expected from thermodynamics, the selectivity towards methane decreases when the reactor average temperature increases. And uh, accordingly, the carbon monoxide selectivity increases. And, and on the right side, there's a temperature profile shown, which we did set into, uh, in the reactor between inlet of 350 and outlet of 300 degrees, uh, which was quite similar, uh, independent of the uh, catalyst load. So the results we, we generated 
are quite encouraging. So we achieved uh, various um, uh, conditions. We achieved very high um, hydrogen and, and carbon dioxide conversion at in the second reactor stage, then finally 100% uh, methane selectivity. And we are planning to, to uh, upscale that reactor technology uh, to a size similar to the reactor I'm, I'm showing here now. It's also an oil-cooled uh, heat exchanger with a power equivalent of about 50 kilowatt. It's also a laser welded uh, plate stack with, with two-stage cooling here even. And that was uh, installed uh, some time ago at a biogas plant, but it's not yet uh, in operation owing to different reasons. With that, I'm coming to the end. Um, the advantages of our compact methanation reactor technology uh, could utilization of the, the catalyst, you get high conversion of the carbon dioxide feed and we can utilize the heat released during methanation. And the integration and subsequent use of this heat is an important additional uh, point, which is required to be utilized um, to improve the, the overall efficiency of the process. And this technology is, is quite well suited for the construction of modular containerized plants. And this is uh, what we are going to do in the near future. We will set up um, such a methanation system in a, in a container and operate it close to uh, different biogas plants, uh, which have different gas qualities. With that, I'm at the end. I thank you for your kind attention. And the German Ministry of Nutrition and Agriculture for funding part of this work. So, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for sticking to the time. Now this session is open for the discussion. Uh, anyone, yeah. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So, thank you, Professor Kolb, for this very interesting talk. Um, I have a question. Um, did you test uh, part load operation of that system? With, because with these cross heat exchangers, it sometimes can be tricky. Yeah, yeah. So we, we operated the system. I, I didn't show all the results. We operated the system between 25 and a uh, little bit more than 90% load uh, of the design. 100% is the design capacity. Yeah. Then okay. we got some, some problems of some of the periphery equipment, uh, which was limited. That was a reason for not going further. Yeah, the, the problems always come from the external parts, never from the core. <laughs> very focused. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, uh, Professor Cole, I have a question. Uh, what is the resistance of uh, the sulfur, the catalyst you have used, uh, is it now resistant to sulfur poisoning? So, sorry, uh, so we showed, we showed that yeah. it's working stable for about 100 hours. Of course, in case there is nickel present, this is uh, not unlimited here, yeah, because the nickel will be uh, going to nickel sulfur, that, that is clear. Yeah. But at least we, we, we could achieve uh, for, for a certain time uh, stable performance in the presence of sulfur. So this is not uh, foreseen to be operated all the time with one ppm H2S. It's only that it not immediately dies when it sees some, some breakthrough uh, of, of small amounts of, of hydrogen sulfide through the purification. Perfect. Yeah, one more question. We have time for one more question. So, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, let us thank Professor Cole for a nice presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, now uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Uh,
uh, it is going to be presented uh, by uh, alessandro porta and the title of the presentation is intensification of uh, co2 methanation by catalyst and process design so uh, i request mr porta porta to please uh, take it further over to you okay you should all be able to see the presentation and hear me yeah yeah please go ahead yeah. okay perfect um okay so my talk is kind of similar to the one we just heard in the sense that we are focusing on co2 methanation and so we move very quickly towards the introduction so we look at co2 methanation in a power to gas um, um context so we for methane starting from uh, waste co2 uh, and uh, renewable electric energy to make methane which can then uh, be used to store the excess renewable energy. Um, very briefly, um, the reaction is exothermic, occurs with a reaction uh, reduction in the number of moles. So we need um, a catalyst which is able to work at low temperature. Uh, and in this context, nickel is by far the most uh, used catalyst because it is the cheapest one. Um, and also it's uh, sufficiently active, but in the temperature range that we are interested in, we, which is around two, between 200 and 300 degrees, I would say, ruthenium is more active. So we dedicated some effort into study a little bit more uh, ruthenium-based catalyst. So we started investigating the metal loading effect. We chose uh, gamma lumina support. Um, and this is the performance of a very simple impregnated uh, 0.5 ruthenium catalyst. Uh, we see there's some CO and some ethane as byproduct as well at low temperatures. And then what we did was basically to increase the activity of the catalyst, we wanted to increase the loading. And then we tested this material uh, at the same flow rate per gram of active phase. So basically we kept the flow rate constant and we decreased the amount of catalyst as the catalyst loading was increasing. These are the results that we obtained. So basically uh, we increased the loading by 10 times. So point, from 0.5 ruthenium, we went up to 5%. Uh, and in this case, the um, there was, I would say there are no relevant changes, nor in conversion, nor in selectivity um, of methane and also in the byproduct. So when we saw this, we uh, thought that actually the dispersion was the same because if the flow rate uh, was kept constant per gram of ruthenium, it means that the same number of ruthenium um, sites were exposed. Actually, then we characterize our samples and uh, we are moving in a very narrow range of dispersion, which is below two nanometers. Uh, but still moving from 0.5 to 5%, there is a, a relevant a reduction uh, in terms of um, uh, ruthenium particle size and the particle size almost doubles. So actually this can be explained from the structure sensitivity of the reaction. So actually we are moving in this uh, part over here. So um, actually in this part of the, um, let's say uh, up until five, four, five nanometers, uh, the turnover frequency is actually increasing. And this effect is effectively counterbalanced by the loss in uh, active surface area. So with the 5%, is it is true that I have a lower surface area, but the lower surface area that I have is more active. So actually, uh, if I, I can increase my metal loading uh, as much as I want, if I stay below this uh, sort of threshold of around five nanometers. All of this was done on um, powder catalyst, it was 0.1 millimeter uh, in particle size. So of course we cannot um, use that in a, we were thinking at a um, fixed pair reactor application. So it became important for us to uh, investigate a little bit about what happens if I change the particle size of the catalyst. So at low loading, so 0.5, when you impregnate ruthenium uh, over, um, we chose in this case a spherical support, it's 2.3 millimeters. Uh, what you get is a very nice eggshell catalyst. So all the ruthenium is staying on the outer shell of the pellet. And this occurs with, um, due to a very strong electric interaction between the uh, ruthenium precursor that we use, which is the nitrate precursor, and the um, surface of the aluminum support. 
However, uh, by changing the pH of the solution, by adding uh, nitric acid, actually we can um, precisely tune the um, thickness of the catalytic layer and until we can obtain homogeneously impregnated pellet. So at this point, this pellet, both in the eggshell form and the, the homogeneously uh, impregnated form, uh, were tested in the same condition and confronted with the, um, let's say that the catalyst working in chemical regime. So the one done, uh, um, prepare on very small alumina particles. And as you can see, also in this case, no changes in conversion, no changes in selectivity, which means that uh, low loading, uh, I can also work with big pellets, with uh, fairly large pellets, without uh, having diffusional problems, I would say. But then what happened if I increase the loading for 10 times? So we move from 0.5 to 5%. So we simulate um, a highly uh, active, I would say, catalyst. So with 5% ruthenium, and we prepared um, larger particles. So the 2.3 millimeters that I showed you before, and also a 0.8 millimeter alumina microsphere. Actually, this uh, impregnation was carried out by um, multiple steps. So we didn't require the use of nitric acid in this case, and we managed to obtain, I would say, fairly homogeneous uh, catalyst. The loading was a bit less than 5%, but still we were kind of happy with the results. Um, and then we compared basically the activity of the same amount of catalyst with the same metal loading, just different uh, sizes of the pellets. And as you can see, when we test larger pellets, uh, there's a loss in conversion and there's a loss also in selectivity. By evaluating the activation energy, we see that it decreases from a factor of two, more or less, which is consistent with the presence of intraporous diffusional limitation. So I guess the take home message here is that uh, if you want to use highly active, uh, um, probably you want to move to smaller pellets impact bed reactors. So uh, for example, you can use a um, packet structure reactor, or of course, as we've seen in the nice talk uh, before, a wash coated structure may be suitable in, uh, in presence of a highly active catalyst. Or another option is to use eggshell catalysts. Of course, the volume of the reactor will increase a little bit, but still you can actually finely tune the catalytic layer according to um, the diffusional uh, limitations that you have. Now that we knew uh, how to treat, how to work with ruthenium based catalysts, we moved to the second part, so a more applicative part. Um, and we wanted to basically produce compatible, uh, grid compatible synthetic natural gas. This is the um, limitations for hydrogen injection. And as you can see, they change uh, a lot from country to country. So we looked into the Italian specification, which puts the threshold level at 1%. Of course, in all this um, methanation, hydrogen is the expensive reactant. So basically we want to minimize hydrogen as much as possible. So this was our goal. So first, very briefly, thermodynamics. Um, CO2 never poses a problem with the threshold that we have for injection. Same goes for CO, which is always very low. And hydrogen is indeed uh, kind of a tough specification to respect. Uh, this is at atmospheric pressure but still we require very, very low temperatures. If we increase the pressure, of course, things get better uh, because the reaction is favored, but still we have to work in a kind of a narrow range. So we tested if our catalyst uh, actually was able to reach the equilibrium in this condition, uh, which was not. So we uh, decreased the uh, space velocity from 50 to it's extremely low space velocity, 0.25 liter per hour gram. And uh, we managed to reach the equilibrium uh, near 200 degrees with almost complete selectivity to methane. This is uh, at uh, atmospheric pressure. Um, then we decided to put uh, a kinetic boost. So we to work with two reactors in series, as we've seen before. And in this way, uh, you have a first reactor working at high temperature and the second one working at lower temperature. And in this way, you can actually uh, reach the equilibrium at a much lower temperature of the second reactor, since you have already converted most of your CO2 in the first one. 
the Y stop there, you can remove the water. And also in this case, you can um, work with a um, thermodynamic advantage, of course, in the second reactor because you're removing a product and also with a kinetic advantage because you are removing uh, water from the reaction environment, which has also a kinetically inhibiting effect on the reaction. So actually we tried this and we managed to, to get um, more than 98.5% of um, methane content on a dry basis, of course, in the alpha stream uh, already at atmospheric pressure. Of course, the space velocity was still kind of low. So the best way to increase that is to work on the pressure. If we increase the pressure mildly, we can also, of course, increase the productivity of the system. This is the conversion and the methane purity that we obtain, which is the um, methane um, molar fraction on a dry basis uh, at the outlet. And then it sort of became uh, something like a game. So how far can we go? And I report here, um, we change basically the temperature in the two reactor and we increase the pressure. And actually we managed to scrape down the hydrogen until like a few hundred PPM. And interestingly enough, at pressure higher than 20 bar, actually ethane was the most abundant pro products, always in the range of uh, 100 PPM. So we were kind of happy with this. And then we moved to the very last part, but we heard a very nice talk just before me. So I'll go very quickly. Methanating biogas, it's uh, of course, methanating biogas directly, sorry. It's a very nice option because you basically get rid of the separation plant. And also the um, reactor technology in principle can be simplified a little bit. This is the uh, packed bed reactor from MAN Energy Solution in Werther in Germany. And you see there's a staged injection of feed always to keep the exothermicity of the reaction at bay. So uh, probably if you have methane inside, it can act as thermodiluent. And so you can, um, it can uh, help by um, diluting the heat generated by the reaction. And of course we tested that and uh, there's no much difference in the, uh, from the kinetic point of view. So there's no uh, big effect in kinetic, I would say. Um, the CO2 conversion is a little bit lower. You see the equilibrium is uh, for the pure CO2 is in red and for the biogas is in green. But of course, if you have uh, biogas already inside, you get a big boost in the overall fraction of methane that you have at the outlet of uh, your system. Catalyst stability, uh, we uh, changed a little bit the formulation, but we managed to get uh, 3.5 ruthenium aluminum. Uh, which was stable for, um, I would say, a thousand hour, more or less, uh, up to pressure of uh, 15 bars uh, in substoichiometric condition also, and also in presence of methane. So we were kind of happy with the catalyst we made here, uh, which brings me to the conclusions. So um, we investigated the metal loading effects. So highly dispersed ruthenium catalysts show the same activity program of ruthenium, provided that we remain in a certain range of um, particle diameter. Supper size effect, so highly active catalysts cannot uh, have very large pellets, otherwise, uh, especially the selectivity decreases. Um, and we can manage to um, be compliant. We be much more than compliant with the specification for grid injection using this kind of material. And also oh, with the biogas methanation, there is small effect on the reaction kinetic, but on the country, a big boost in the purity of methane that you can uh, achieve. And with that, I finished and I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Now this is open for discussion. Any questions from audience? Uh, maybe I will start. Okay, so uh, is there any specific reason in choosing ruthenium catalyst? Did you also try with any other combination? Uh, yes, we have also been looking into nickel um, since I am going back a little bit to the first. The uh, actually the activity per uh, this is the turnover frequency uh, for ruthenium, nickel, and rhodium. And in the application range that we want, which is 200 300 degrees, mostly ruthenium is more active than nickel. 
so the single site is more active. Of course, if you get to a very high loading of nickel, you can balance out to the two things. Um, but still, we wanted to investigate it ruthenium because it's sort of uh, less looked into in the literature, I would say. So, and there are also reports that ruthenium is more easily to regenerate from sulfur, uh, and we are or also looking into that at the moment. Fine, thank you. Any other questions from audience? Yeah, it, it seems there are no no more questions. Uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we will move on to the next presentation. So it is going to be delivered by uh, Professor David Simakov. And the title of his presentation is CO2 Hydrogenation Reactor, the Experimental Proof of Concept and Techno-Economical Feasibility Assessment. So I request Professor uh, Simakov to take it further. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. I assume everybody can hear me and see the presentation. So this presentation yes, is on uh, CO2 hydrogenation uh, through the Sabatier process. And there are two parts here. One is the experimental uh, lab scale investigation. Uh, and the other part is uh, uh, techno-economic uh, assessment. Okay, so in the beginning, just very brief introduction on uh, CO2 capture and utilization. And then uh, the first part will be on the Sabatier reactor experiments and the second part on techno-economic assessment. So this is just uh, to briefly remind the concept of the CO2 utilization by conversion. So we can get CO2 from different sources. We can use renewable electricity or nuclear power as well to generate um, hydrogen by water electrolysis and we can react hydrogen with CO2, making fuels and chemicals. Uh, and just to remind that we have, uh, of course, uh, different uh, pathways of CO2 conversion, biological, photocatalytic, electrocatalytic, and thermocatalytic. And each pathway will have certain advantages and disadvantages. In our lab, we are focusing on thermocatalytic approach, okay? Uh, and this approach, of course, has certain advantages as well as disadvantages. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, thermocatalytic conversion uh, uh, is very diverse. And uh, the technology is basically proven because our uh, current chemical industry is mostly based on thermocatalytic conversion. So in this talk, I'm uh, focusing on high temperature CO2 hydrogenation. So um, uh, the target reaction is a battery reaction. Of course, we will always have reverse water gas shift as well and CO2 methanation, potentially. Okay, it depends on conditions, of course. And we should not forget about coke formation, of course, which can occur by different uh, pathways, uh, both endothermic and exothermic. So we should keep an eye on this one. Uh, this is a system concept. Uh, so we have water, electricity, uh, this particular one uh, is for landfill gas utilization, but same concept, of course, applies to uh, pure or purified CO2 utilization. And the uh, reaction is a thermic, of course, we need cooling. Uh, cooling, uh, we can do it using molten salts, uh, which is efficient, but complex. Uh, but uh, compressed air could work as well. And uh, at least in our lab scale, uh, uh, investigation, I will show you results with compressed air cooling, which works pretty well. So we have basically three different scales, catalysis, reactor, and system. So in this talk, I'm focusing on the reactor and system. We just, uh, we just implemented industrial uh, commercial uh, nickel uh, on alumina catalyst, the one which is used uh, for steam methane reforming in industry. So this is uh, the reactor, it's basically made of switch lock parts, it's quite easy. So we have inner tube for cooling, quarter inch, and the outer tube is uh, one inch, nine inch length. So we have around 60 gram catalyst and uh, we have a heating tape on the inlet uh, just for preheating. So the reactor is operated, uh, could be operated without any feed preheating with cold feeds. The, the reaction is very exothermic to produce heat enough. And we need, of course, a lot of insulation. 
Uh, and Ichin Zhuang, he is uh, my PhD student uh, who has actually done uh, uh, this experimental work. Okay, so this is the catalyst, the well known once again reforming catalyst. So, crushed sieved into around one millimeter particles. This is the catalyst loaded into the reactor. And this is uh, the reactor, as I, as I said, made, to, made of uh, switched off parts, very simple design, basically tube and chill. This is uh, the coolant air, compressed air or compressed nitrogen. Sometimes we use the same thing, basically. And this is the direction of the uh, Sabatia flow, uh, CO2 plus hydrogen and products at the end, of course. Okay. So we use the standard flow system uh, with mass flow controllers and so on. So we are measuring here as an outlet composition using infrared analyzer after removing cold water and moisture based on dry basis. So this is the reactor with uh, thermocouples inside. So we installed some thermocouples because even for this small upscale reactor, we have some interesting distribution in terms of temperature profiles. And as I said, we need a lot of insulation. This is a ceramic uh, wool and then a ceramic uh, cloth. And on top of it, uh, some uh, aluminum foil just uh, to reduce uh, radiative uh, heat losses. Okay, so these are... Uh, this is reactor ignition. So on, on the left side, you can see more fraction. So in the beginning, we are feeding nitrogen, preheating, then feeding hydrogen to reduce the catalyst. Uh, and then as we introduce the CO2, you can see almost immediately we have ignition. On the right hand side, the black line, this is the feed temperature, which is in the beginning high or because of the preheating. And then we switched it off completely. As you can see, the black line goes down and we have nice ignition. Uh, and we are measuring also a couple of temperatures on the reactor wall at different uh, uh, locations. And uh, so this is the effect of feed temperature. So as we, so we tried increasing the feed temperature and uh, by increasing feed temperature, providing more heat, we increase the reactor temperature and actually conversion goes down. As you can see, we start from 90%, this is single pass. 100% selectivity, once again, industrial nickel catalyst. And uh, as we uh, increase uh, the feed temperature, conversion goes down by 5%. And not surprisingly, because uh, according to equilibrium, as we go to higher temperature, the uh, conversion will go uh, down as expected. At some point, selectivity will go down as well, okay? So this is the effect of space velocity. Uh, as we increase space velocity, basically providing uh, more flow, so we are generating more uh, heat and temperatures uh, go up again. And once again, we lose some conversion, okay? Uh, but still conversion between 80 to 90% single pass, 100% uh, selectivity. You can see that at a certain point, as we overheat the reactor, uh, selectivity starts to drop as well. And this is all co-current flow. Uh, this is the effect of cooling flow rate. As you can see with compressed air, we can, you, you can see clearly the effect of cooling. And then actually as the, the temperature of the reactor goes down, more effective, uh, more efficient cooling, uh, we see that conversion goes up. And once again, we're operating here between 90, uh, 80 to 90%, sorry, of CO2 conversion and uh, practically 100% selectivity. And we also checked the uh, co-current versus counter-current flow. And we did see some differences, but uh, not major differences, probably because this reactor is quite small. Um, it's only basically uh, roughly 10, as I said, 10 inch lengths. So the reactor is not very big on only 60 gram of catalyst. Um, uh, but on large scale, the effect could be more pronounced, of course. And, and finally, uh, uh, we have selected a certain set of uh, more or less optimal operating conditions. This is a stability test over 100 hours operation. You can see perfect selectivity to methane production and conversion is roughly 94%. This is once again, single pass using a commercial nickel catalyst and temperatures are stable, conversion selectivity are stable as well. And we check the effect of impurities such as H2S as well. Uh, of course, it will affect the catalyst. So uh, this is pure CO2. We've done uh, some experiments which were reported in another paper uh, uh, with uh, a mixed feed simulating uh, bio biogas or landfill gas as well. 
So H2S should be removed uh, as efficiently as possible for nickel catalyst, of course. Okay, a few words about uh, techno-economic assessment. This part was done by Sogol and Robert, who are former master students in my group. So this is, once again, the concept of using renewable electricity or nuclear, nuclear power could be used as well. Uh, making renewable natural gas. So this work uh, was done uh, assuming that we have landfill gas as a feed, which is a mixture of methane, CO2 and nitrogen. So this is kind of black box uh, schematics. And uh, so the idea here was to evaluate the price, okay, uh, the energy production cost. So in the beginning, we've done just very rough calculation on a piece of paper. So this is a formula. So production cost will be capex plus opex multiplied by time, normalized by the flow rate of the renewable natural gas produced times the heating value times uh, multiplied by time, okay? And this formula can even more simplify it, assuming that after a certain time, we are paying off uh, the capex and assuming that relatively quickly. So we can uh, simplify this formula. It's very simple, as you can see, and we can actually calculate production cost. And it shows that it's going to be uh, roughly 80% of the electricity uh, price. And this is of course the minimum production cost. Okay? And then we can plot it as a function of the electricity price. As you can see for 10 cents per kilowatt hour, everything is US dollars. Uh, we are getting uh, around a $20 per gigajoule RNG uh, production cost, which is uh, quite expensive for North America but actually not far away from the current prices of natural gas in the European Union, okay? Uh, and this is uh, so, and another important thing that 90, 80% as expected of the production cost is going to be the cost of electricity and electrolyzers. So we have done system design. This is including upstream and downstream purification uh, to meet the uh, specs according to North America, uh, Canada requirements, of course in terms of hydrogen, CO, CO2, and so on, removing nitrogen as well, of course. So this is once again for landfill gas. This is Aspen ISIS uh, simulation. And uh, so we have calculated for large landfill site uh, located in Ontario, Canada, with 5,000 standard cubic uh, uh, foot uh, per minute of biogas or landfill gas. 40% uh, methane, 30% uh, CO2, and the rest nitrogen and impurity. So, and, and we've done very thorough analysis, including all purifications and downstream uh, separations and purifications as well to meet the specs of the uh, pipeline, of the natural gas pipeline. So as you can see, we need roughly $100 million, but this is large scale project and it's quite expensive. Uh, mostly the cost of hydrogen production, this is capital investment. And we need roughly $30 million uh, per year. Uh, this is operation, uh, operational cost, once again, mostly for hydrogen production. And uh, the power rating of such a plant will be roughly 50, 60 megawatt. So it's, it's a lot, it's a large project, a lot of money, but it's also a good thing for excess electricity uh, to balance uh, the grid, because we know that renewable electricity is intermediate, of course. And everything here is calculated for uh, a very optimistic electricity price of five cents per kilowatt hour. But this price is actually achievable at certain places, like in Quebec in Canada, where we have a lot of uh, hydropower. So it, it will depend, of course, on heavily depend on the price of electricity and availability of electricity. Okay, so this is once again, large scale uh, landfill, converting landfill gas directly, single pass, with of course, uh, upstream purifications and downstream purifications, uh, uh, converting to renewable natural gas pipeline quality. Okay, uh, so this is uh, the economic feasibility calculated some standard parameters. So this is cumulative cash flow, as you can see the payout period is approximately six years. And of course, it will depend once again on the electricity price, uh, but we are basically getting uh, production costs in the range between 15 to 25 uh, US dollars per gigajoule natural gas. It's normally three to four times more expensive than uh, prices of natural gas in North America. But once again, as I mentioned before, 
uh, it's quite comparable to the current prices of natural gas in the European Union. So it, it looks promising in, in any case. It, it doesn't look like very cheap, but it looks quite promising. And uh, I think uh, this is one of the directions we should move uh, in terms of large scale uh, implementation, okay? Uh, finally, I would like uh, to acknowledge uh, federal and provincial funding and also our industrial collaborators. Uh, and uh, the most important thing, of course, is to acknowledge my research group, my uh, graduate students, uh, undergraduate students and postdoctoral researchers who are actually uh, doing uh, most of the work. I'm just supervising them. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer, of course. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much. Now this session is open for uh, discussion. Uh, any questions from audience? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. So uh, I'm, I'm surprised of, of this uh, PSA unit you, you introduced, you said it's mostly for nitrogen separation, so I, I wasn't familiar with that idea, but wouldn't it be better to to put it then upstream already, the methanation? Uh, maybe, to be honest, we didn't check this option. It will depend because uh, nitrogen will act as a dilutant. It's actually, uh, it could be good uh, for absorbing some heat. It could be done upstream or downstream, I believe. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we have calculated uh, uh, for downstream separation of nitrogen, but it could be removed uh, before as well. So it actually could be interesting to check which option will be more efficient to do it before or after. But th th that could, could save the, the purification downstream, perhaps, so if there is no nitrogen left in yeah, the Yeah, but we have to remove nitrogen at some point in any case. Yeah, 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 that is clear. But if it's upstream, maybe it, it purifies everything and, and, and you only have, well, maybe you save something. <laughs> Just an idea. Once again, yeah, I, I cannot uh, say which option will be more efficient. Uh, it will be actually interesting to check. Yeah, we have time for some more questions. Uh, maybe one more question from audience, if anyone is interested to ask. Yeah, uh, it seems there are no further questions. Uh, let us thank Professor Simuko once again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we, yeah, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to the next presentation. So uh, the title of the next presentation, the kinetic modeling and NMPC simulation uh, for the oxidation reaction of the soya bean oil. And this will be delivered by the PhD student, uh, uh, Mr. Gusto Vieira Olivieri from University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yeah, now over to you. Thank you. Uh, I believe you can see my screen, my screen. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you for the int introduction. So my name is Gustavo Olivieri, greetings from Brazil. And this, uh, this project, this study was made jointly with Henrique da Silva, Jacir de Quadro Jr. and my uh, supervisor, Professor Reinaldo Jutzi. Well, firstly, why do we need to study the, this reaction, this, the reaction uh, to produce the epoxidized soybean oil? This, this product of this reaction uh, comes from a renewable source, which is the soybean oil. This substance is also biodegradable. And this, uh, this study also uh, follows the tendency of the increase in the studies uh, involving renewable substances. So it uh, fits one of the principles of the green chemistry. Uh, the main application of the epoxidized soybean oil is uh, as a plasticizer for PVC. Usually, uh, 
pesticides for PVC uh, are called phthalates, which are uh, petroleum-based substances. But these substances uh, present uh, carcinogenic potential. So currently, there are, there are more strict regulamentation for the use of plasticizers in PVC. So the epoxidized soybean oil is a good alternative to replace phthalates. Well, PVC can be used in several applications, such as pipes, medicine packaging, automotive parts, toys, electrical wire coating, uh, and many other applications. Uh, the epoxidized soybean oil can also be used uh, as can also be used uh, to be polymerized to produce pressure sensitive adhesives, for example. It can also react with alcohols to produce biolubricants. Uh, this, this versatility of the epoxidized soybean oil comes from the uh, potential of functionalization of the, the, the substance. But what is the reaction system to produce the epoxidized soybean oil? Usually, it is used a biphasic reaction system uh, in which we have an aqueous phase and an organic phase. The two main reactions uh, are highlighted here. And the first reaction is in the aqueous phase and is the reaction between a hydrogen peroxide and a, a carboxylic alcohol to produce a, an organic peracid. This organic peracid tends to migrate to the organic phase to react with the double bonds of the soybean oil to produce uh, epoxy ring groups uh, that characterize the epoxidized soybean oil. And this group is the group that can be functionalized for other applications further. This reaction system also uh, presents some undesired reactions such as the decomposition of the organic peracid and also the decomposition of the uh, oxyran ring in the interface between aqueous and organic phase. So firstly, we developed a kinetic model for this reaction system. And this kinetic model involved mass balances for the main substance in, the, in this uh, reaction system, an energy balance the heat and mass transfer effects, equilibrium relations for both uh, mass phase equilibrium and also chemical equilibrium for this reaction. Of course, this kinetic model involved the reaction kinetics for the, uh, all the reactions I presented before. Thermodynamic properties, a correlation for the droplet size, because here we have a, an aqueous phase, which is thus dispersed as droplets in the continuous organic phase. So we needed to include a correlation for this droplet size. And the main contribution of this, the, the present study is the inclusion of the effect of the apparent viscosity of the, the biphasic system. To develop this kinetic model, we had available uh, data of temperature, apparent viscosity, iodine index, and oxyran index previously published by, uh, in the thesis of the Quadro Junior. Uh, just to clarify what these two properties mean, the iodine index is a value proportional to the number of uh, double bonds of the soybean oil, while the oxyran index is a value proportional to the number of oxyran groups of the epoxidized soybean oil. Well, we had 21 parameters, uh, adjustable parameters in this kinetic model, and they were subdivided into three objective functions. The first objective function focused on the temperature and involved uh, seven parameters of the model. The second objective function uh, focused on the apparent viscosity and involved four parameters of the model. And the third objective function focused on iodine and oxyran index 
and involved 10 parameters of the model. So we had three objective functions which were um, which were minimized uh, jointly using a MATLAB code. And here are the results of the, the fitting of this kinetic model to the experiment, experimental data. So part of the experiment is experimental data we had available were used to fit the model. In part, were used to uh, validate the model uh, further. So we had uh, here we have the the fitting of the model in part of the data, in which we can see that the model can represent uh, the tendency in the temperature profiles in the apparent kinematic viscosity profiles. Um, and also for the iodine index and oxyrem index profiles. Here we have the 21 parameters uh, results for this kinetic model. And I would like to highlight the, these four parameters here, which are the kinetic parameters of the main reactions of the system. So these four parameters uh, agree well with previous previously published studies in the literature. In part of the data were used to validate the kinetic model. So here, the, these temperature data uh, were not used to fit the model to this data. They were used only to predict, uh, the, uh, to, to check the capability of prediction of the kinetic model. Here we can see that the model can predict well these overshoots in temperature uh, for these reaction systems. The model was then used for a, an MPC simulation of this reaction system in a batch reactor. Uh, an MPC stands for nonlinear model predictive control simulation. Okay. So the first uh, procedure we used was a dynamic optimization for the system. So we had a, 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 an objective function in which uh, our objective was to maximize the concentration of oxygen groups uh, in the, at the end of the reaction. For this, we used as manipulated variables the temperature of the reaction system. This, this reaction system, uh, consisted in a two-hour batch time. And this reaction time was subdivided into 20 control intervals. So we had 20 var values of temperature uh, in order to maximize the concentration of oxygen groups at the end of the reaction. These values of temperature are called set points of temperature and were then used in the second objective function of this procedure. So now our goal was to make the, the, the temperature of the reaction system as close as possible to the set points. For this, we used as manipulated variable the flow rate of the heat transfer fluid. And here are the results for this NMPC simulation. So here we have a, a temperature profiles in which this stairs graph uh, represents the set points in temperature. The blue line represents the, the temperature of the reaction media or the reaction system, in which we can see it follows the tendency of the set points in temperature. Here in red, we have the, the profile for the temperature of the heat transfer fluid. Here we have the mass flow rate of the heat transfer fluid as a function of time, in which we can see that in the beginning of the reaction, we need to use a higher value for the mass flow rate of the heat transfer fluid. This happens because uh, we have exotherm exothermic reactions and so, so we need to use uh, a, 
higher value of flow rate of the heat transfer fluid to absorb the energy generated by these exothermic reactions. Uh, with the time, this mass flow rate tends to decrease since the, the reactions tend to be slower. And here we have the profiles for the iodine index and oxygen index. So for the iodine in index, this profile tends to decrease until a value of 5.5 uh, grams of iodine per 10 grams, uh, 100 grams of oil. So uh, we almost uh, converted all the the double bonds of the soybean oil. Conversely, for the oxygen index, this value tends to increase until 6.6%, uh, in which we can conclude that we have a high value, that uh, a high amount of oxygen groups uh, produced in this system. The, the highest value we can achieve here is uh, was estimated as 7.5 percent so 6.6 percent is a good value for this this reaction system i would like to highlight as well that these results were simulated for a two-hour reaction system which is uh, significantly lower than the eight to twelve hours uh, batch system which are currently used in the industry. So in conclusion, we developed a kinetic model uh, in which the main contribution was the, the inclusion of effects of the apparent viscosity. The model provided a good fit to uh, the data we had available and also provided a good uh, prediction capabil capability uh, of other data. This kinetic model was then used in a preliminary NMPC study with promising results uh, for the iodine and oxygen indexes for a two hour uh, batch reactor system, uh, which is significantly lower than the eight to 12 hours uh, implemented currently in the industry. So I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this conference Universidade de São Paulo, FAPESP, and CNPq for providing the, the scholarship for this PhD project. Thank you so much, and I would like to answer any questions you may have, and you can also contact me by this email. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Now this is open for the discussion. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, good morning, Gustavo. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, uh, I just, I don't know if I missed some information, but what was the, the reactor capacity you've been working? Uh, for the NMPC, we, we also, we actually used a, a 500, uh, half a liter, of reactor. We intend to expand this reactor uh, for industrial purposes uh, and extend the simulations for, for higher reactors. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Some more questions. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I just uh, I have one question. What are the main uh, assumptions you have in this model, mm -hmm. NMPC model? Uh, do you do you have any specific assumptions you are making while proposing this model? Yeah, we have uh, some uh, assumptions concerning the 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 model, the kinetic model. For example, uh, we assume there are no uh, accumulation in the interface between the phases. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see. Uh, 
uh, we assume that the droplet size uh, is spherical for the uh, dispersed phase, and this droplet size is constant. Mm, let me see. Well, there are other uh, assumptions. I, I just don't remember uh, here in my mind, but there are other assumptions we, we used to develop this kinetic model. Uh, this kinetic model was uh, published in this study, in this, in this paper, uh, in which we present all the assumptions uh, developed here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. If there are no further questions, uh, let us thank uh, Mr. Valvieri. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now we yeah. We will move on to the next presentation. So this will be delivered by uh, Professor Sibili Agastra Fiera Leti. And the topic of the presentation, the study of agitation in anaerobic uh, biodigesters. So this is from University of Florestal, Brazil. And over to you, Professor. Okay. Can I share the screen? Please, yeah. Please do that. Now, just... Is the presentation okay for you? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? yeah it's good. Okay, that's good. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Sibeli Leite. I'm going to present the work, uh, Study of Agitation in Anaerobic Biodigesters. Uh, first of all, I'd like to present a little bit of myself and the University of Vissosa. Uh, I am a professor at UFV uh, in a small campus uh, in a city called Florestal. Uh, although we have some important industrial cities in the neighborhood, we are surrounded by many small cities and uh, which the main economical activities are agriculture and livestock. So when we came to UFV, uh, we realized it, it's import, it was important to develop some researches on waste valorization, uh, thinking of agriculture residues and crop products, and also thinking of energy and materials. So that this is our background. Also, uh, I think it's important to present uh, a brief uh, information about uh, Brazilian total electricity supply. Um, I'll give you some information about it. If you can see in this picture, most of our energies come from hydro and biomass source. Uh, although it seems interesting um, this is renewable energy. We have many um, challenges in this. Uh, for example, we've been now experiencing an energetic crisis in Brazil uh, because of the because of lack of uh, rain. Um, hydroelectric energy it's important, but the, it has some vulnerability because it's dependence on rainfall regime. Um, also, when you think here of biomass use, most of bi our biomass are sources are sugar cane, the gas, and black liquor from paper and pool mills. Biogas, it's not uh, it's not so important on our electricity supply. We just have 0.1 percent of biogas being used. So um, here also uh, we can see from this, this graphic, our potential for energy generation through co of agricultural residues. Um, here we can see that biomass and biogas, sorry, and biogas energy generated increased in the last years 
but uh, biogas energy potential it's much higher 400 uh, megawatts it's our potential so this is our potential and this is our current um, uh, potential uh, of biogas being used nowadays so uh, why do we have this potential for biogas production well we have large amount of uh, agricultural residues generated in brazil this is because of our high production and also because of the characteristics of agriculture and livestock activities just to uh, give an example, uh, three tons of banana pseudostem. Okay, this is from production of banana. This is the pseudostem. So three tons are generated for every one ton of banana produced. So thinking of our agriculture uh, production and livestock, so we have many residues that have this potential to be used for biogas generation. Well, but you have many challenges here. Uh, biogas, of course, is a few if all technical and economic conditions to be exploited here. But political and technology challenges, uh, we have many political and technology challenges. I would like to emphasize some. For example, we need to expand the scope of the anaerobic biodigestion in rural areas. Nowadays, we can see predominant sector as swing farming, even though we need to expand in swimming farming to expand the use of biodigesters with different technologies. Our predominant uh, kind of biodigester is the covered legume. Also, we need to develop technology to reduce biogas generation costs, uh, thinking of process efficiency and increase knowledge of the agricultural waste Cod digestion uh, process. Well, um, according to our current scenario, uh, our main objective in this work is to investigate the use of agitation systems for cod digestion of agricultural residues in order to contribute with technical information needed for the enlargement of this process. Uh, we investigated the influence of vegetation conditions on anaerobic biodigestion performance, thinking of biogas production and effluent quality. And also we investigated a method to apply reproducible agitation conditions, considering the characteristics of the fluid, the mixture of our substrates and the characteristics of the biodigesters. Well, uh, we've been thinking of uh, developing an accessible and reproducible methodology that avoids some qualitative terms also found in the literature, like um, minimal agitation, manual agitation. So this is uh, our interesting. We, we needed some accessible and reproducible methodology. So um, to achieve our objective, we propose these, these paths, uh, these steps, okay? Um, our first step was to prepare the substrates, the swing manner plus rice husk. Then we proceed uh, physical chemical characterization of them, thinking of organic matter, uh, nitrogen consen uh, content. Also, it was very important for us density and viscosity because they helped us to set operational conditions. Then we proceed the, this uh, operational condition sets. We decided 35 degrees Celsius. That is a mesophilic uh, temperature to, to use in our experiments. And we decided uh, to buy a disaster, one with ag agitation and other without agitation. The one with agitation was operated intermittently. The agitation was uh, performed each six hours with a mixing time of two minutes. Then we proceed a bed feeding test of 25 days. Uh, we did the process assessment uh, through uh, biogas generation also 
we analyze it chemical oxygen demand, solids, nitrogen to understand the quality of the effluent. Then we uh, proceed a uh, semi continuously uh, feeding test for more 34 days. And at this step, we fed the biodigester with a small quantity of the substrate and withdraw 600 millimeter, milli, milliliters of effluent. Okay. We also proceed uh, the process assessment with uh, all with these parameters, and also we analyze the biogas uh, generation, the quantity, and the methane, uh, the quantity of methane on this biogas to understand uh, its quality. Okay. Well, the scan uh, performed for the experiments. This is the biodigesters we use it. Uh, they are made of PVC. Uh, we had a heating coil to promote uh, uh, the heating inside the, the, the biodigester. There are the tubes here. Uh, it was to allow the entrance and the exit of the effluent. So the agitation was made by uh, the, res the recycle of the recirculation of the effluent. And we put an external pump for effluent uh, recirculation. Okay. Well, um, here comes our first results. Um, these are the parameters used to calculate the radius number. Um, we use uh, density, viscosity, and characteristics of the jet to calculate Reynolds. Well, our goal was to, to promote Reynolds uh, lower than, than 2000, 200, sorry, to favor laminar agitation. Uh, it was not possible because the, we could just set the, the lowest uh, velocity uh, of the jet uh, was 0 0.18. But we, it's almost uh, two, uh, two, uh, sorry, 2,000, so we proceeded the experiments. Well, using Reynolds and also the um, characteristics of the biodigesters, we calculate the mixing time. So what was this mixing time? Was the time needed to promote the homogenization of the mixture? So each six hours, we proceed two minutes of effluent uh, recirculation, okay? Well, then we analyze it, uh, the performance of the process uh, to understand if the, the agitation, this, if this agitation pattern was good for our process. Uh, in this bad step, we did, we did a similar biogas production in both biodigesters. Okay, we had no, almost no difference, but we, we came for the semi-continuous process. We could see that agitation uh, represented by biodigester B1 uh, got higher production of biogas. Um, at the end of the process, we are comparing the, the data from the end of the process, uh, biogas and methane content, uh, the biogas produced and the methane produced was also higher uh, with the, the biodigester with agitation. Also, we used the organic matter remover, removal, to, to understand biodigester process. So we, as you can see in this table, all these parameters analyze it that represents organic matter. Um, for all these parameters, organic matter removal was better for the B, B1. Yeah, that's our biodigesters, biodigester with agitation, okay? Well, some considerations, some assumptions we did for carrying out this work. This is a preliminary study that used a mixture with a low solid content. 
So because of this low solid content, the mixture of substrate exhibits a Newtonian fluid behavior. And also we consider the biodigesters behaviors like a CSTR. TR. Uh, we consider the intermittent agitation as the better, the best one, since uh, previous results present in liter literature, uh, seems that intermittent agitation is better than the continuous one. And also consider the laminar regime chosen in order to avoid the breakage of the microbial flakes. Our conclusions, um, the applied agitation promoted a better performance of the analyzed co-digestion process. Uh, it was possible to establish a reproducible agitation pattern by calculating the radiant, radiant number and mixing time, considering the characteristics of the fluid and biodigester used. Similar experiments can be carried out in order to reproduce the agitation patterns using it and evaluate the biodigestion performance. Complementary studies with the aid of CFD would help us to understand the valid and validate the applied methodology. And I would like to thank our group, it's a small one, as I told you, it's a new site or University of Visosa, but we are very proud in the work we've been doing. And I would like to thank the institutions that helped us to, to bring this, this work for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Now this is open for the discussion. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, so it seems there are no questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. So uh, the, uh, we will move on to the final presentation. So the title of the next presentation, the effect of the catalyst and the reaction conditions on polymethyl methacrylate depolymerization in a fluidized bed reactor. This is going to be delivered uh, by Dr. Olga Chuk from Ecole Polytechnique de Montreal. Now, uh, this is over to you, Professor. Please make a presentation.
the next speaker is not going to join so if i understand correctly there is a message from uh, minister to to so that she can join us now so in the absence of that one i think uh, now we are come to an end of the session i think there is uh, there is a message from the organizers that the, this chemical reactor conference 24 the closing ceremony is going to take place at 12:40 uh, ut it's going to be on the session one and uh, please do join there and i thank all the speakers for sticking to the time and uh, for making this as an interactive session and i thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity and uh, we close it here thanks a lot okay thanks a lot to all of you Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. start your presentation okay uh, this right. for everybody who is uh, in the conversation now okay hello everybody uh, my name is olga chub i going to start my present I, i hope you you hear me and i just need to find how can okay sc share screen okay so my presentation is dedicated to effect of catalyst and reaction conditions on polymethyl metacrylate depolymerization in fluidized bed reactor. First of all, uh, I would like to point accent on what is PMMA. So polymethyl metacrylate is lightweight, transparent, thermoplastic material. Uh, this is a specialty polymer for different industries. So we are familiar with this uh, material when we drive a car. So we know this is a rare lights of car. Uh, we have our screens uh, on our laptops and computers and our cell phones. Um, we can see PMMA as a <clears throat> as an artificial stone in our kitchen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So annual uh, production of PMMA exceed 1.4 megaton per year. Uh, worldwide production so the that's why the main question is how to recycle this plastic to um, different chemicals or to something uh, useful we can say that uh, pmma world market will exceed 770 million dollars to 2025 and uh, there are different technologies which can nowadays uh, which exist which which exist nowadays which can transform polymethyl metacrylate to its monomer met methyl metacrylate <coughs> sorry 
This is molten lead or teen bath pyrolysis of polymethyl metacrylate fluid as bed or mechanical recycling. But all of these uh, technologies have their limitations due to um, ignoring of polymethyl metacrylate, which contains different fillers, um, colorants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, another question is how to produce, um, transform polymethyl metacrylate to metacrylic acid. Why it's important? Because metacrylic acid <coughs> can be uh, produced with a, a higher purity than methyl metacrylate. So it's easier to purify all byproducts from uh, this uh, product than uh, to purify byproducts from methyl metacrylate. So, Nowadays, we find that there is no technology which can proceed with this question. Uh, so our objectives regarding to what I told right now, our objective is to convert polymethyl metacrylate to methyl metacrylate and then hydrolyze methyl metacrylate to metacrylic acid in fluid as bed reactor. I can also add that uh, polymethyl metacrylate is the only polymer which can 95% degrade thermally to its <clears throat> monomer. But here we need to find the conditions for catalyst and for a reactor to uh, maximize the yield of metacrylic acid. First of all, the first problem which we uh, can meet when we introduce plastic <clears throat> in fluid as bed is uh, um, um, that pl uh, plastic particles will melt in in the bed in the in the reactor, and they will cover the catalyst particles, um, following by sintering segregation of particles and total defluidization of uh, fluid as bed and stop the reactor. And in different studies, uh, the researchers started uh, such question as. Um, conditions uh, between, uh, regarding feeding of uh, polymer and feeding of uh, catalyst and flow rate in the reactor, <clears throat> as uh, also particle size and reactor temperatures. Uh, here we started from <clears throat> our investigation from uh, answering the question, what can we, uh, which particle size should we introduce in the reactor? Because we are working with the lab scale reactor, we started our studies from uh, particles 1,000 microns to 150 microns. We uh, did uh, several runs um, using TGA method, using TGA equipment, and we found that when we decrease the particle size uh, in, uh, in a flow of nitrogen, we uh, revealed that the curves shows us that uh, the the curves coincide so the smaller particle size the closer curves to each other that means that we minimize the effect of heat and mass transfer in our reactor this the next step we need to uh, find the optimal conditions in the reactor as temperature so we did the next set of runs uh, with the plastics with different molecular weight and we found that plastic ignites approximately at temperature 270 and it co completely decomposes at 400 Celsius at different heating rates. In addition, we provided experiments with a lower weight uh, um, polymer, the same experiment, and we found that the, the interval of temperatures is the similar. Additionally, we um, analyze the gas phase during decomposition of polymethyl metacrylate and we found that the primary gas product of our polymer is co2 and the liquid product is mma so here on the right graph you can see that the black uh, peak which is dtg curve coincides with the peak of, uh, obtained by ms which corresponds to mma production and we can uh, see that the mma is the primary product so now we know which conditions we can use in the reactor. And also the molecular weight of our polymer doesn't affect drastically on the ignition temperature, or the temperature of the degradation, sorry. Uh, reactor hydrodynamics was the next question. So we know that we are uh, 
uh, to maximize the effectiveness of uh, reactor performance, we need to uh, provide the irritability of the particles in the reactor. That's why we refer to the Geldor classification of the particles, which we can use in our fluid bed reactor. And we found that uh, particles of class A is the most suitable. Uh, from the literature, we know that there are several uh, ways to organize fluidization in the reactor, but at the same time, the bubbling regime is the most stable and provides the higher density of uh, solid phase in the reactor. So that's why we limit it first uh, in particles of uh, class A, and also we found that the the uh, linear velocity in the, our reactor will be limited by two minimum fluidization velocities. The, the lab scale a reactor consists of a uh, reactor by itself, which placed in the oven. We uh, place PMMA powder in the chamber under the nozzle. And when we open the, the line with the uh, nitrogen which uh, goes for injection at close the injection valve we increase the pressure gauge and when we open it the particles will be uh, introduced in the reaction zone by pulsation uh, the heating line uh, with the water will provide the water feeding in the reactor with the gas going for fluidization of our reactor our gas products uh, accumulates in an ice bath, and we measure the pH of our products after the reactor and the gas phase we're measuring by MS. So uh, we were using different types of catalysts as uh, alumina, ox alumina oxide, uh, molybdenum zirconium hot homemade catalyst, FCC cracking industrial catalyst, and sand uh, uh, consisting of 95% of silico 2 for uh, blank test. Molybdenum zirconium uh, catalysts provide high stability to high temperatures to uh, poisoning by water and they provide a high rate of Ronsted, uh, high density of Ronsted acid sites on the surface of the catalyst, which confirmed by different investigations. So we impregnated uh, the um, molybdenum and zirconium precursors by stepwise method with the subsequent uh, drying in rotor vapor and calcination in the furnace. XRF investigations show on us the composition of the final catalyst. FCC catalyst uh, represents the silica alumina um, zeolite Y um, matrix, which is phogazite type of catalyst with impregnated lantanium uh, uh, and iron oxides on its surface. We used uh, the catalyst with the, part, uh, with the mean size of the particles, like 55 uh, microns. Our results, uh, so first of all, we, we fed uh, um, our particles in different, at different conditions. Uh, first set of run we did at uh, catalyst volume about 4 milliliters, and the uh, molar flow ratio between PMMA and water, like one per month, like equimolar um, feeding of water and uh, polymethyl metacrylate. So here we uh, can say that alumina, had, uh, alumina oxide mostly degrades to methyl metacrylate, and uh, only FCC catalyst uh, gives very small amount of metacrylic acid. And molybdenum denum zirconium catalyst uh, mostly degrades to coke and methyl metacrylate. The rest, of, we kept the same volume of the catalyst, but we increased the ratio of water uh, seven mole per uh, one mole of PMMA. The results completely different from those which we had before. So here we have higher yield of uh, metacrylic acid on alumina oxide. We have maximum, um, uh, the FCC represented the highest activity uh, comparing to alumina and molybdenum zirconium. And also molybdenum zirconium gave us 2.4% uh, molar percent of MMA yield, MAA yield. Then we increase the volume of the catalyst to increase the um, contact time in the reactor. 
And here the uh, results change drastically. For example, FCC doesn't produce uh, metacrylic acid anymore. So it burns everything to coke. We have mostly coke and uh, acetone, some amount of acetone in the reactor. Alumina oxide can give us 1.4% uh, of metacrylic acid, but this is almost twice lower than before. And the highest activity represented uh, our homemade catalyst. It gave us like 5% of metacrylic acid. Comparing to sand, uh, which gave us almost 3% of metacrylic acid with, so without any catalyst. So our conclusion, uh, according to these uh, results, that FCC catalyst exhibits better performance at lower loading volumes due to lower contact time. Increasing over contact time uh, provide, uh, leads to increasing the yield of MAA in molybdenum zirconium catalyst. At the same time, aluminum oxide produces mostly met met methyl metacrylate at low volumes and degrades metacrylic acid to uh, gas to CoCO2 at high volumes of uh, acid. acid. Totally, um, generally speaking, uh, 350 Celsius provides us the, the quick um, degradation, the quick sublimation of uh, particles of plastic in fluid as bed reactor. But at the same time, we degrade all the products, which we uh, our, our target products to CO2. So maximization of yield of metacrylic acid is possible a decreasing of temperature and catalyst volume for FCC catalyst and increasing of molybdenum zirconium catalyst volume. Thank you for the attention. And yeah, Dr. Shub, thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, do anybody have questions? Uh, well, if not, then we're closing this session, this section, and uh, uh, the closing ceremony is expected to be on time, maybe plus minus a couple of minutes. Uh, so it's better to be uh, in stream one at least uh, uh, five minutes before start. Well, thank you very much. And now we this now we're closing this session. Yeah, and the second one, the, 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 the coefficient H is an apparent permeability. Yeah, in this case, as a result of the development, these are tensors. The first one is a fourth order tensor and the second one is a second order tensor. Yeah, and as we can see, these, uh, these tensors are defined in terms of closure variables. In this case, uh, the, the uppercase V is a second order tensor and the lowercase V is a vector, yeah? Uh, therefore, in order to predict this coefficient uh, or this effective medium coefficient, we need to solve or we need to know the, these closure variables. And, we, and the, the method allows us to obtain the boundary value problem associated to these, um, to these uh, closure variables. The, then, uh, now that we have uh, the closest form of this equation, we need to predict the effective medium coefficient. Uh, and, as, and, as, and as I mentioned, uh, these coefficients are defined in terms of closure variables. We solved the boundary value problem associated to the, these the closure variables in a representative domain of the, uh, of the fixed bed. Uh, and how we build this, uh, this representative domain? Well, uh, we take uh, layers of, so we consisting of seven, seven particles as shown in this figure. And we put uh, every layer one over the other and each layer was rotated up, uh, around the actual direction, 30, 30 degrees, and until uh, we reach the a, a unit cell or a representative domain, we solve it in this representative domain, the boundary value problem. As you can see, this is not the complete uh, fixed bed reactor, but, uh, and with this, with the, once we have uh, the, 
the, the, the, the fields of the, the, the closure variables. And we computed the effective median coefficients in different positions along the, the, the radial direction. And we can see the following profiles. For example, this is a two-dimensional profile of the void fraction in, in a cross section of the pixel bed. Yeah, uh, as you can observe, it is periodic. And if we take um, a cut line from this two-dimensional two profile, we can observe the following uh, profile. We, we can see that uh, we have uh, uh, two maximum values in this case. Uh, also, we have two minimum values in the, in the void fraction profile in the radial direction. Well, uh, we compare it, these uh, profiles with a widely used uh, correlation, the, which provided by the clerk. And we can observe that our predictions are only similar near to the wall. This is here is located the wall, and this is near to the to the core of the fixed bed. Yeah, we have important deviation near to the core of the of the bed. Well, this is the apparent permeability. Yeah, um, this is the cross the two dimensional spatial variation, two dimensional variations of the apparent permeability. If we take a, a good line, we can observe following the behavior. Uh, we can observe also we have two maximum values and two uh, minimum values, uh, which are consistent for with the with the void fraction. Well, uh, this is a, a, for a Reynolds number, uh, one thousand and forty hundred. Yeah, a particle Reynolds number, and we also perform the calculations for other particle Reynolds number. Uh, as we can observe, uh, these coefficients it depends on the uh, on the particle Reynolds number, and we, which means that uh, it increases the the permeability um, dec decreases with the, the values of the particle Reynolds number. Well, uh, now that we have these coefficients, we are ready to to validate our model and to validate this or to perform this, we compare it the average velocity profiles resulting from the solution of the effective median equation. That we obtain it in this work with those obtain it from averaging the pore scale profiles. It means that we first and um, solve the, the local model in, in uh, the representative domain of the fixed bed reactor. We can observe uh, the following profiles, local profiles, where, where we can observe the, the presence of the solid particles. In general, we can observe that uh, the larger values of the velocities are near to the wall. And the lower values of the velocities are in the core of the wall, of the of the fixed bed. Well, uh, with these um, local velocity profiles, we take different uh, uh, volumes and we uh, apply the superficial averaging operator, and in different positions in the radial direction, and we we obtain the following profiles. Uh, this is the local the, uh, the, an example of the local profiles. And this is the the average the, the average profile. As you can observe, uh, many of the information, the local information, was lost. Uh, but this is because the average process. Well, uh, taking these velocity profiles, we can take uh, uh, good lines, and we can observe the following. Uh, we uh, the following profile. Um, as we can observe, we have two maximum values also. Um, in one of them is near to the wall here. And the other is near to the to the core of the fixed of the bed. Yeah, we also computed these profiles for other Reynolds number, and as we can observe, uh, or as we expected, that, that uh, by increasing the Reynolds number, the the magnitude of the velocity profile increases also. Well, uh, now we are ready to compare these velocity profiles with those obtained from uh, the resolution of the average model obtained from the for, for, from our methodology. Well. Uh, the black points are those obtained from the body scale simulations, and the red line are, uh, are, are those obtained from the volume averaging method. As we can see, um, those profiles obtained from the volume averaging method are in good agreement with those obtained fr uh, from the body scale simulations. Yeah, um, We also solved it, the, 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 the conventional approach, which, uh, which we mentioned it, is the Navier Stokes. Uh, Darcy Forshamer equation, uh, and and you can observe that um, th this model overestimates the uh, the the velocity profiles in two zones in around the two ma two maximum values and uh, near to the wall and uh, near to the to the core of the of the bed. Yeah, this this happens for the three uh, Reynolds numbers that we we computed. Well, we also have the comparison for the average pressure profiles. 
uh, also we obtain it a similar uh, uh, results with the red line, which is the volume averaging method results. Um, we can observe that they are closer uh, to those obtained from the poor scale simulation. As a final analysis, we uh, we computed the, the, the magnitude of the term that captures the presence of the solid particles. And for the original values of the uh, alpha and beta, as you can observe, uh, we have a uh, uh, the de important deviations, yeah, and that's why we have uh, important uh, deviations in the average velocity profiles. Uh, we also computed this term for uh, estimated values of alpha and beta reported in the literature, and we can see that even when we uh, estimate this coefficient, we have uh, deviations in the in the magnitude of this term. Well, um, as conclusion, we can say that we have derived a macroscopic model to describe hydrodynamics in a fixed reactor with a low DTNDP ratio. And, and this model uh, can describe hydrodynamic, the hydrodynamic in a fixed reactor uh, of a low, with a low DTNDP ratio. And this method allows us to predict the effective medium coefficients by means of a local closure problem. And the, the a salient point of this is that uh, the solution of uh, the, solu the, the solution domain of, of the, this local closure problem is just a representative domain of the fixed bed and not the whole uh, fixed bed. Well, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Robert, for your very nice talk. And the paper is now open for discussion. Is there any comment or question from the audience? Please feel free to open your mic and turn on your camera to ask questions. I, I, I have yes. a question. Thanks for, for, for your presentation. How does your model will change or influence, for example, when you're taking reactions account with a huge uh, volume change, right? The, either uh, the volume expands or the volumetric flow rate uh, essentially decreases. And in addition, when you have multiple uh, or you have a catalyst particle uh, distribution, you have now a perfect uh, a system, which it's in reality, it's not perfect, right? We have usually a rather, uh, I don't know, narrow or strong particle size distribution. Can you maybe comment on this? If your model will be able to account for volume change in reaction as well as different particle size distribution? Um, yes, uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, um... For example, all the profiles that we obtained in this case, uh, we fixed the size of the of the volume of the Averain domain, yeah. And this is for fluid mechanics. Uh, well, uh, the same volume that we use in this case, uh, we uh, should be used for modeling also the heat or mass transfer, not. But um, if we change the size of this Averain volume. Uh, of course, we expect that the profiles, all the profiles, not only the, the velocity profiles, uh, will change. Yeah, uh, if we increase the, the size of the of the this Averian domain, uh, the, um, the probably the velocity profiles re will reduce. Yeah, and of course, it will influence the results that we will obtain. Um, uh, when we are comparing with uh, observe experimental observations, and, uh, and a strategy to fix the or to determine the, the correct volume, uh, in many cases, uh, should be based with with the experimental uh, devices. Uh, I think uh, because if we take uh, uh, for the case of velocity, if we take volumes or images to measure the, the velocities. Uh, larger velo uh, images, for example, for example, in a pay pay IV uh, instrument. Um, if we take uh, large volumes of or or, or images, uh, we we the, the volume that we should take in this methodology which should be in accordance with that uh, with that measurements. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Roy, again for your very nice talk. Okay. And we can Thank now move much. to the last uh, presentation of this session and of the conference. We remain in Mexico uh, in the Metropolitan Autonomous University. The speaker is the PhD student Alberto Hernandez Aguirre. 
and uh, the paper is titled uh, DNS based detective medium model for the compressible flow in a fixed bed reactor with low DT over DT. So please, Alberto, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, good morning for all. Um, I will talk about uh, the most recent publication of the work, uh, titled Framing a Novel Approach for Pseudo Continuous Modeling Using Direct Numerical Simulation or DNS and Fluid Dynamics in a Packet Reactor. In this work, we try to connect the, the local scale with the pseudo continuous scale. Um, the, the, the local scale is described by the using microscopic Navier Stock equation, while that the, the pseudo continuous scale uh, consider the that the, the solid and the fluid phases are a single um, pseudo continuous phase. Here, the, the properties of the, the solid and fluid uh, phases are, are considered that, um, throughout the, of the use of effective, effective coefficients. Here, um, the, the hydrodynamics is described by using Navier Stock equation with, coupled with a a D term that consider the all resistances due to the, the fluid, the, due to the, the presence of the solid. Um, here uh, we determined uh, the, the, the so-called uh, fluid dynamic descriptor, the void fraction, and the, in, in this case, the, the upper impermeability through of the use of um, particle result simulations. Um, <clears throat> The contents of this presentation is a brief introduction, the research questions and procedures, results, and conclusions. And as is well known, an inadequate description of the fluid dynamics in a world cooled packet reactor is essential to describe the performance of high-leg exothermic oxidation reactions. It is because the, the fluid dynamics governs the heat and mass transfer mechanism. Here, um, for, for that, uh, considering the fluid dynamics in the world, the modeling of the world cooler packet bed reactor uh, can improve the production of the temperature profiles and have a better control of the hotspot. So um, the proper design control or optimization uh, requires the development of a reliable model describing properly fluid dynamics. For several decades, uh, the fluid dynamics in, a, in the packet bed has been described by using pseudo continuous modeling approaches. And the, the main um, approach is con uh, have been considered a Navier stock equation coupled with the Darcy and Forsheimer. Here, the effective coefficients capture the, 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 the main contribution of the, the solid and fluid uh, phases. And these, these coefficients. These coefficients are the, the both fraction and, the, and a term taking account the resistance by the solid presence. Here, the Darcy for shamer is the most used. Um, this term uh, consider the, the upper the Darcy permeability and the, the for shamer coefficients. Um, this, these coefficients um, are, have been determined by using uh, correlations, the well known correlations and the clerk or empirical expressions in the better of the cases that uh, this empirical expression is fitted to uh, pressure drop uh, observations. And this leads uh, to uncertainties on the coefficients. An alternative uh, is the use of the, an, a, a new approach, taking account the pseudo continuous uh, simulations based on particle result simulations. Here we, we propose the use of Navier stock equation with a D term that consider uh, all solid resistances in the packet bed. And um, here the, the fluid dynamic descriptor are determined, the, the void fraction and the, the solid resistance in the D term are determined from particle result simulations and volume average method. And um, the question here is, is is it possible to transfer information from the local uh, scale to the pseudo continuous scale to obtain an, an adequate description of the velocity profiles in a packet bed reactor? To answer
start the official closing of the conference in a couple of minutes. Okay. Colleagues, uh, so uh, finally we have finished all our presentations, all our uh, activities uh, at the Chem Reactor 24 conference. I would like to start uh, to start the closing uh, of the conference. Uh, I prepared some uh, presentation, um, but maybe first uh, I will uh, ask. Uh, our colleagues uh, from Milano Politecnico, Matteo and Gian Piero and Enrico, can you please say a few words about this conference and uh, about your impressions of this conference? Please. Okay, I I will start since my mic is uh, switched on as far as I see. Mm. Well, I'm extremely satisfied. I'm, I'm extremely satisfied that the wishes I make at the beginning of the conference, uh, having top level uh, plenary lectures and keynote speakers, uh, having uh, very good quality presentations uh, from also very young scientists, uh, has become a reality. So. I, I'm, I'm satisfied that this difficult Milano edition of Chem Reactor, let me call it like that, has succeeded in keeping the quality, the historical quality of the Chem Reactor conference series at this level. And let me also add, add that I'm quite satisfied to see that the chemical engineering community, and specifically the chemical reaction engineering community, is so alive. I see advanced methods and or conventional methods apply to the new challenges that this uh, energy transition era is, is posing to all of us and specifically to our community. And I guess that this was a very good stage to show what the chemical reaction engineering community is doing in this field. So overall, again, thanks to all the attendees, to the plenary lecturers and to the keynote speakers. And again, thank you to you and all the people from Boresco for the organization level of the event. 
thank you. Okay, so I can say a few words. So I fully agree with Gian Piero, and uh, I was very satisfied by the quality of the presentations. And in particular, uh, as Gian Piero already said, uh, our community is a very lively community, and uh, he will certainly have uh, a prominent role uh, in the, uh, all the challenges that we have ahead in terms of energy transition, especially. So we have seen uh, electrification coming into the game, uh, both at the level of the reactor scale or electrocatalysis and contamination with the catalysis as well. So I think uh, it's a good hope also for all of us, uh, for the young people also to have uh, a great future in our, in our discipline. I also want to say a big thank you to Andre and uh, Tatiana. So we interact quite a lot uh, together with Giampiero during these two years or three years almost. So it was a, a very, you know, uh, active uh, interaction. I think we came along uh, pretty well, uh, and this actually is reflected also in the success of the conference. So thank you again for uh, this opportunity. Okay, thank you. Just one word from my side. Uh, my colleagues who have been really involved in the organization of the conference have already uh, said uh, many things, uh, and uh, I would like just to add my congratulations to the whole organizing and scientific committee for the for a very successful and very interesting and stimulating conference. Uh, let me just add that I was particularly impressed by the quality of the plenary lectures that you selected. Uh, my compliments, uh, they have been extremely inspiring, uh, and I'm sure that uh, there will be uh, follow-ups on, uh, on, con uh, on their contributions. So again, uh, I'm glad that Milano has been part of this uh, very successful uh, event. And I'm very grateful to our Russian friends and colleagues for the involvement of the Milano group in this, uh, in this uh, activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrica. Uh, okay, uh, maybe I will now make a presentations about some statistics of the conference uh, and uh, other related things. And afterwards, of course, everybody who will want to say a few words, uh, you will have such uh, an opportunity. So let me start. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a minute. Okay. Do you see my presentation? It's okay. Yes. Okay, uh, so a few words about our conference, which has finished uh, at the moment. Uh, first of all, uh, just statistics. Uh, I should say that uh, this conference was attended by 251 participants from 38 countries. Uh, consider, uh, comparing this result with the previous chem reactors, I should say uh, it is a little bit unexpectedly because, you know, we all uh, made this conference in uh, not very easy times, right? Uh, but I should say it's one of the best results during at least last 10 years, I think. So uh, nevertheless, despite any uh, difficulties uh, we have uh, managed to make together, of course, such a conference with at least such a great attendance. Uh, you see the world map here, and the green color here shows the uh, participants, uh, the countries which participated in this conference. You see, it seems that we already occupy. Uh, so the green color is uh, at least half of the territory, I guess, maybe. Uh, and we'll work more uh, to expand this territory, of course. In general, we had six plenary and six keynote lectures and i would like uh i'm also uh, like enrico want to say that uh, the selection of lecturers in my opinion was brilliant and it really it was very interesting presentations uh of course there were uh, also uh, very interesting oral and poster presentations we have uh, 130 orals and approximately eight, 80 uh, posters. And I should say, we, here we have also significant expansion because in our previous conferences during the last five or six times, uh, at least, uh, we have usually 80, 85 uh, oral presentations uh, and two uh, conference streams. In this conference, we uh, 
we have found that we have uh, very many uh, interesting uh, contributions and it's not easy to select something like 80 or 90. And so we decided to make three conference stream. It's in my mind, it is uh, it gave positive results. And uh, finally, we have more oral presentations. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, of course, our International Scientific Committee and its chairman, Valentin Parmon. So you see it's very uh, representative uh, organ, a very representative committee. So uh, the people who are really respected in our chemical engineering area and who did a lot for development of uh, chem reactor conference, of course. Uh, regarding this uh, conference, I would like to uh, thanks uh, to say thanks uh, to uh, our chairman, uh, Alexander Naskov, uh, Professor Alexander Naskov, and Professor Jean Pierre Gropi. Thank you very much uh, for chairing the conference and uh, organizing team. Uh, I would like to mention Professor Matteo Maestri and Tatiana Zamulina. All these people made a great, uh, huge uh, work uh, for preparation of this conference. And I should also would like to mention here the conference uh, organization, Ilios Company, who is our partner, Chem Reactor part partner for already 15 years. And so of successful uh, cooperation, collaboration, I would like to say, uh, to say uh, gratitude to the, uh, David Maharadze, the director of this company and Yulia Zhartov, who also worked a lot uh, on the organization of the conference. Uh, we have, uh, it's a chem reactor tradition that uh, for each conference we select the program committee because uh, the selection of uh, contribution is a very, um, not a, a easy process. So actually each abstract, uh, each contribution is evaluated at least uh, those contributions for oral presentations are considered by at least four reviewers, sometimes five or six reviewers to provide uh, independent and objective uh, evaluation of, of all contributions. And I should say that all people mentioned here, uh, the people from Bariskov Institute of Catalysis and Milano Polytechnica, uh, it's a joint, uh, very effective, efficient team, uh, which did a, a really, it's a, not a joke, huge work on uh, reading and evaluating, uh, reviewing of all these uh, contributions. I am very grateful to all these people for their very significant and big work. Uh, I would like to, uh, to say thanks to a local organizing committee from Politecnico di Milano and also to uh, the team which provided the technical support. Uh, you see that our conference was a little bit unusual for us, uh, not say a little bit, quite unusual for us, uh, because we had uh, uh, online presentations and uh, three parallel streams and so on. So every time in each stream, we had uh, some supervisor people, uh, uh, mostly, all these people are not uh, special experts, they are also participants of the conference, they participate like researchers, but at the same time, they were helping to arrange all technical side. It's people from Bariskov Institute, also from Institute of Solid State Chemistry here in Novosibirsk, uh, from uh, Ilya Maharaza from Ilios, and actually we also had uh, support from professional company Video Profi, who uh, provided the all this work, including the simultaneous translation of uh, all presentations, uh, not only in Zoom, but also to YouTube. Uh, and of course, I will, uh, I'm uh, very grateful uh, to the most important people in our conference, to our participants, the people without whom our conference is simply impossible. And uh, in my mind, I have very, uh, positive, very bright impressions from the current conference. Uh, I see a lot of uh, very interesting, very professional, uh, very skilled people. And uh, I also would like uh, to support uh, the impression uh, that uh, we are a very live community. That's right. Uh, it was very interesting, very... It was uh, uh, not interesting only from a scientific point of view, but it was also interesting to communicate. Okay, uh, 
uh, what we will do afterwards. A few words about our the conference is completed, by, uh, but still we have something to do afterwards. The first of all, uh, about this post-conference issues, the first thing is uh, mm, from one side we had complicated a task to make the conference online, but at the same time, it gives new opportunities. Uh, uh, for example, we had a YouTube translations of all presentations. And I should say that uh, uh, all these presentations will be kept uh, and will be made available at uh, YouTube um, for unlimited time. So you will have a chance, uh, anybody will have a chance to, uh, for example, if you have missed some presentations, uh, something else, uh, you can then get back and watch uh, any moment uh, of the conference. So every all conference is recorded and we can get back and uh, see it again if we will need this. So uh, we will, uh, late, a little bit later, uh, we will provide information uh, about the references to YouTube. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, first time at least it will be uh, these players which were placed in the conference website, they will be kept at the same place. And so it will be uh, uh, possible to uh, see the, this uh, recording uh, just through the YouTube references at the conference website. Of course, a very important question, a uh, very important part of our conference is uh, conference proceedings. And uh, as usually, as uh, traditionally, we have very good collaboration with the chemical engineering journal, which uh, now uh, is, uh, seems to me, uh, maybe number one uh, journal in chemical engineering in the world, or among very best journal at least. And uh, so uh, actually we are very proud of this collaboration. Uh, so again, in this case, we have an agreement to make a thematic issue dedicated to our conference. Uh, and uh, I will just repeat uh, the common rules. They are the same uh, like in previous conferences. Uh, so there is a strong rule that only contribution presented at the conference, really presented, physically presented at the conference will be considered for publication. Uh, manuscripts, uh, first of all, you, you should prepare the manuscripts, uh, maybe in some preliminary form, uh, but first please send it to Tatiana Zamulina, you see the address here, uh, conference secretary, for preliminary selection. So uh, usually we, our program committee, we just uh, look through the list uh, of uh, all, this, uh, all these manuscripts. And we uh, just to be sure that uh, the quality of manuscripts is acceptable, and uh, but usually it is acceptable in major majority of cases. And but uh, also to be sure that the important question that uh, the manuscript corresponds to the publication profile of this journal. So don't forget that it is an engineering journal mostly. Uh, then uh, authors of uh, selected papers will receive an invitation to upload the manuscript to uh, editorial system is usually you no know, usual procedure and uh, all manuscripts will then undergo regular journal reviewing so without any let's say discount yes so uh, I would like uh, to ask the main problem uh, I, as a guest editor of uh, this uh, such special issues, I, would like, I, I want to say that the main problem in preparation of uh, such is issues is uh, uh, a problem to how to find the reviewers, enough reviewers which, are, uh, which will provide the review in a uh, necessary time and so on. Uh, sometimes uh, to collect three review reviews, we have to invite uh, sometimes 10, sometimes 12, so our record is 20 uh, invitations to reviewers, uh, so it, it is not easy, of course. It's a problem in all journals, as I know, currently. Uh, so uh, if you will receive uh, uh, the invitation to review some, of, uh, some, men to review some manuscripts in this uh, thematic issue, uh, please don't refuse. And please don't ignore uh, the invitation for this reviewing. You will help uh, all our other participants. It, it doesn't mean that you, you are asked to give uh, 
predominantly positive decision. No, uh, you have you as a reviewer, you can make any decision uh, you think it is uh, necessary, but uh, just don't don't refuse from reviewing, please. Uh, in this conference, we also, uh, if, if somebody would like, uh, we also have additional option, another one, a journal catalysis in industry. It's also a journal which is indexed in, in Scopus. So uh, if the people will decide to publish here, you're welcome as well. Uh, uh, we consider uh, the social part of any conference, and especially uh, Cam Reactor Conference, uh, the social part is very important, and we have uh, many years of traditions uh, that usually uh, we, uh, we have not only scientific uh, communications and the conference, but we have a lot of personal communications. Uh, in my mind, it's quite seriously, uh, this is one of the most important functions of uh, conference, the conferences, uh, so to provide the uh, contact between people, including uh, the contact on some uh, social level, not only scientific. Uh, unfortunately, in our case, we had no possibility to provide the, as usually, the conference dinner. Uh, nevertheless, yesterday we had some singing party and dancing party. Uh, and I should say, and yesterday I told, I just will repeat now that we are going to uh, make uh, such uh, um, joint, uh, to create a joint song. Uh, so uh, a, a little bit later, uh, we will send you all uh, the, uh, the necessary instructions how to do it. In general, I can say that uh, there is a text, uh, there is a music, and there is, will be some example uh, of how it is possible to sing this uh, text uh, with this music. And we will need to have your uh, audio records, how you sing this question. And the, uh, the song, and afterwards, we will try to combine this in one track. And uh, our aim is uh, to make something like a choir singing of conference particip participants and uh, with some preliminary brand singing conference. I think it's, uh, it will be interesting. And uh, I don't know actually uh, other chemical engineering conferences, which had uh, such experience. We will be maybe the first one here <laughs> in this area. Okay, uh, so we'll send all instructions and uh, possibly we'll place all necessary uh, things uh, at the web conference website. So the conference website will stay alive and will work uh, for a long time more. Uh, uh, finishing my presentation, uh, just, uh, to remind the list of last, uh, the list of chem reactors starting from uh, chem reactor 13 in 1996 when it became uh, international just meaning maybe this this event included included uh, two participants uh, out from outside russia but uh, you see the history and uh, the history it seems to me uh, is very interesting and of course this is not the end of the history and i would like to forward uh, then my uh, words uh, to the host of the future, uh, Chem Reactor 25 conference. So uh, please, Günther, uh, are you here? I'd like please to- Please, of course. Ah, hello. Please, please say if you, yes. So you see also the screen, uh, the slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so- uh, from my side, uh, I want to announce uh, that uh, the location of the next conference was decided to be Germany, and we still uh, are about to find a well-suited location. It will be in the time window September to October 2023. Uh, the current local organizing group is uh, Hans Freund and Kyle Olaf Hinrichsen and myself. And we will do our best to maintain the high quality of the conference, which will hope, hopefully be a live conference then again. So let's not hope that the situation will stay similar 
so as it is currently. And also, but not exclusively, uh, after having heard now uh, the presentations of the last few days, we think it will be a good idea to keep on focusing on the consequences and the ideas of, of chemical engineers related to the new solutions which are which can be uh, realized uh, through the energy transition. Yeah, so I think this was uh, very lively and interesting discussions about these new possibilities yeah, which make it possible to move things onward, which have been maybe sticking for quite a while. Yeah, so I will be pleased uh, to welcome you all uh, in, in two years' time, approximately, in Germany. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunther. Uh, I should say that uh, during last uh, few last chem reactors, uh, maybe the one of the strong uh, sides of chem reactor is uh, that we are uh, lucky. Uh, we had very good partners uh, uh, for organizing the conference. We have, uh, like in this case, we, uh, we have excellent partners in Milano Polytechnica, and I'm very grateful uh, to them. And uh, seeing the proposed list of uh, organizers uh, of the next Chem Reactor event, I see we, we keep this tradition and this uh, collective is, uh, looks excellent. And I hope it will be the great conference as well. Thank you, Gunther. Okay, uh, does anybody else want to say some, something? You have a possibility to do this right now. Um, uh, Janko Pachinski from Montreal, Canada. I would maybe like to also to, to say uh, something. I was surprised. First of all, thank you for the nice uh, uh, conference organization and, and the really the, the good talks. I was surprised that the chem reactor was never in, in North or South America or even in, in Asia. So I would like maybe to propose, uh, if possible, to hold it in not 2023, maybe 2025, in four or five or 2026, maybe in North America, maybe in Canada, maybe in Mexico, if that is an, an option and there uh, would be nice. Uh, I know we have also a strong uh, team here in, in North and, and South America that, you know, would be, I guess, willing to host uh, this conference after the German one. So I, I don't know if that is something, uh, keep an open mind and we are all up for it. And uh, yeah, I just want to throw it out there. If you're welcome, uh, if you would like to travel over the, the Atlantic or the other side uh, to the uh, Asian countries, uh, I think that is something we should keep in mind. Mm. Yes, uh, it's very, very, uh, very correct. Uh, very good uh, proposition. Because we uh, actually we still are inside Europe, uh, uh, and uh, we are thinking for many, not many, but for a few last uh, maybe two or three events, we already start thinking about some other territories, including of course USA, Canada, or Mexico. Uh, and it's uh, very good that you uh, initiated this discussion, so your proposal is already taken into account. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So all other people who want to propose uh, also some other countries, territories uh, and so on, you're all welcome. Uh, maybe now, maybe you can write afterwards if you like. Uh, so, of course, we, we are thinking about the future, about some future events. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, it seems that all the words are told, are said. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, all of you, uh, again, and uh, welcome at Chem Reactor 25. See you. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Andre. Thank you for everything. Compliments. Bye. Bye.